Well, hello, welcome to the last session of Anchor Bible School. It's good to see you all nice and dressed up, and uh, we have an exciting study in the next several minutes. But we want to have a word of prayer to ask for God's guidance, first of all, and so let's just bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being here this afternoon. Uh, we thank you because we're able to study this magnificent prophecy of Daniel 11, 40 to 45. We ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit that you might give us understanding of this uh, complex passage. And we thank you for hearing our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, basically we're discussing how we can discover Ellen White's comments on any given text or passage without her quoting it or even alluding to the language. Daniel 11 is a good example of how to do it. So we're going to follow the material that you have before you, uh, line by line, precept by precept, here a little, there a little, and hopefully we'll be able to cover it within the time constraints that we have. There is a passage in the book of Daniel which has always been a subject of lively discussion among Seventh-day Adventist theologians. And that passage is Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Until recently, most of the Adventist scholars agreed that the king of the north represents the papacy, and the king of the south represents atheism or secularism. But now a new view has appeared on the horizon that sees radical Islam as playing a significant role in the fulfillment of this specific prophecy. Those who have embraced this view have concluded that the events of 9-11 and the war against Al-Qaeda are so significant that they must be contemplated somewhere in Bible prophecy. This has sparked a new interest in the study of the fifth and sixth trumpets in conjunction with Daniel 11 verses 40 to 45. Now usually Ellen White has provided invaluable guidance in the interpretation of difficult prophetic passages, but unlike other passages in the book of Daniel, Ellen White seems to be silent on these specific verses, especially verses 40 to 45. Nowhere, to my knowledge, does she ever quote verses 40 to 45, nor does she echo the terminology that is used in these verses. This seeming silence has provided uh, individuals with the idea that Ellen White had nothing to say about these specific verses. We therefore ask, did Ellen White have anything to say about the meaning of these verses, or does her apparent silence indicate that their meaning would remain a mystery until long after her death? In this article or this study, we will seek to answer this question. Now let's discuss, first of all, Ellen White's use of Daniel 11. To my knowledge, there are only three primary Ellen G. White references to Daniel 11, except for one that is found in the little booklet, A Word to the Little Flock Scattered Abroad, to which I'm going to make reference later in this study. One of these three primary references is general in nature and indirect. Excuse me, one is indirect, the other is general, and the other is quite specific. Only in the specific reference, once in her writings, does Ellen White actually quote any verses from the chapter, and those verses that she quotes are verses 30 to 36. Unfortunately, as stated before, she never quotes nor does she even allude to the language of verses 40 to 45. So it would seem well nigh impossible to discover how Ellen White understood these verses. Now let's take a look at these three 
specific quotations. As I mentioned, one of them is indirect, another one is very general, and the third is more specific and she actually quotes verses in that one. The first quotation is indirect, because she does not specifically mention Daniel 11, but only alludes to it, and I'm going, I'm going to show you in what sense she alludes to, the, to Daniel 11 without actually mentioning Daniel 11. In 1896 Ellen White wrote the following words, The light that Daniel received from God was given especially for these last days. The visions he saw by the banks of the Ulai, and I put in brackets there Daniel 8 verse 2, in other words Daniel 8 was given next to the Ulai, and the Hydekel, the vision that was given by the Hydekel was Daniel 10 verse 4 and chapter 11. The great rivers of Shinar are now in process of fulfillment, and all the events foretold will soon come to pass. Now the second quotation is found in Testimonies, Volume 9, and it was written in 1909, and if you're going to the next page we find the quotation there. Here Ellen White states, the world is stirred with the spirit of war. The prophecy of the eleventh chapter of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. So in 1896 she wrote that the visions that Daniel received by the Uli, that's Daniel 8, and the Hydekel, Daniel 10, uh, through chapter 11, the great rivers of Shinar were in the process of fulfillment, and she says the events would soon come to pass. And in the second statement she actually mentions the 11th of Daniel, but she doesn't quote any verses, and she says that it has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Now there's another quotation, and this one was written in 1904. It is the only quotation where Ellen White actually quotes verses from Daniel 11. As I mentioned before, she quotes verses 30 to 36, and now I read that specific statement found in Manuscript Releases, volume 13, page 394. She says, We have no time to lose. Troublous times are before us. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. The prophecy in the eleventh of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. And then she says this, Much of the history that has taken place in the fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. In the thirtieth verse a power is spoken of that shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do, he shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. And then she quotes verses 31 to 36, and she ends by saying, Scenes similar to those described in these words will take place. Those are the only three quotations from the writings of Ellen White where she either alludes to Daniel 11, refers in general terms to Daniel 11, and actually quotes verses from Daniel 11. Now we need to analyze these statements to find out what we can glean from them, what information is valuable in determining her concept of Daniel 11. Now let's examine first of all the quotation from Testimonies to Ministers, page 112, the first one that was written in 1896. This statement has two key items of information. First, the prophecies of Daniel 8 and 11 run concurrently and are parallel. Is that point clear? The prophecy by the Uli was the one given in chapter 8, and the one by the Hydekel was the one given in chapters 10 and 11. 
And so basically by saying that, that these prophecies are in the process of fulfillment, and soon what is prophesied will take place, she's, she's saying that Daniel 8 and Daniel 11 are parallel. And we already studied that in one of our previous classes, remember? Uh, that you have this book within the book, and it begins with Persia in chapter 8, and then chapter 11 begins with Persia also, and they work their way through. So what I want us to notice then is the prophecies of Daniel 8 and 11, or 10 and 11, are parallel. The second point that we need to take into account is that both of these prophecies were in the process of fulfillment when Ellen Wright wrote in 1896. Unfortunately, in this statement, Ellen White does not specify how much of the chapter had already been fulfilled when she wrote the statement, correct? She simply says that Daniel 8 and Daniel 11 were in the process of fulfillment, but she doesn't say where the fulfillment was, the beginning of the chapter, the middle of the chapter, or the end of the chapter. She merely stated that these prophecies were in the process of fulfillment. So we would be interested in knowing where the process was. Now, the quotation in Testimonies for the Church, volume 9, page 14, adds some very valuable information. When Ellen White wrote this testimony in 1909, she stated that the prophecy of Daniel 11, this is the important detail, had nearly reached its complete fulfillment. So do we know from this statement where, where the prophecy was in its fulfillment? Yes, it was towards the what? Towards the end of Daniel 11. So, the quotation in Testimonies for the Church, volume 9, page 14, adds some very valuable information. When Ellen White wrote this testimony in 1909, she stated that the prophecy of Daniel 11 had nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Thus we can be certain that in 1909, the process of fulfillment of Daniel 11 was in the last few verses of the chapter. Is that point clear? Now, the third quotation, the one from Manuscript Releases, volume 13, and page 394, written in 1904, contains some significant information that is not found in the other two quotations. In this statement, Ellen White explains that much of the history that had taken place in fulfillment of this chapter will be repeated. The critical question then is this, which history was she referring to that would be repeated? Fortunately we don't have to guess, because she immediately quotes verses 30 to 36. Then right after she quotes these verses, she again repeats the thought that much of the history that has occurred in fulfillment of these verses will be repeated when she says, scenes similar to those described in these words will take place. Are you understanding that point? Very, very important. In other words, she says, much of the history that has fulfilled uh, this chapter will be repeated. Then what does she quote? Verses 30 to 36. And after quoting verses 30 to 36, then she says, scenes similar to those described in these words will take place. So which are the events that already took place, that were fulfilled? The events in verses 30 to 36. And in the future, we're going to find that scenes similar to the ones in verses 30 to 36 will take place. Clearly, Ellen White understood that verses 30 to 36 and I might say also verses 37 to 39, even though she does not quote them, had already been fulfilled in the past when she wrote. Is that clear? They had already been fulfilled. She says they will, you know, they'll be seen similar to these. Now if verses 30 to 39 had already been fulfilled in the past, then the similar future scenes must be described where? In verses 40 to 45. Thus verses 30 to 39 describe events in the past, while verses 40 to 45 describe events in the future. Is that clear to you? Not real clear. Well, let me go over it again because this is a very important point. Let's go again to the, this paragraph. 
Ellen White understood that verses 30 to 36 and also 37 to 39 had already been fulfilled in the past when she wrote. Is that point clear? If verses 30 to 39 had already been fulfilled in the past, then the similar scenes that she said would be fulfilled in the future must be verses 40 to 45. Because if 30 to 39 were fulfilled, and there's going to be future scenes similar to those, then the only place you can look is verses 40 to 45. Is that point clear? It is important to realize that Ellen White, this is vitally important, Ellen White is not saying that these verses have a dual fulfillment. She's not saying that verses 30 to 39 are going to be fulfilled twice. Once in the past and one in the future. What she is saying is that much of the history that fulfilled these verses will be repeated. Stated another way, it is not the prophecy in verses 30 to 39 that will be fulfilled once again, but rather much of the history which fulfilled the prophecy in the past that will be repeated in similar fashion in the future. Is it different to say that the prophecy will be fulfilled twice than to say that much of the history will be fulfilled twice? It's very, very different. This, these verses don't have a double fulfillment. It's just that they were fulfilled in the past, and in the future there are going to be scenes similar to the ones that were already fulfilled in the past. Now, let's notice, let's pursue this. At this juncture in our study, we must ask, what or why will the historical scenes of the past repeat once again, in similar fashion? The answer is not hard to find. The arrogant and persecuting power that is described in verses 30 to 39 is the Roman Catholic papacy, as it behaved during the 1260 year career. During this period it joined church and state and used the sword of the state to persecute dissenters. So in other words, verses 30 to 39 are speaking about the career of the papacy during the 1260 years. As is well known, at the end of the 1260 years the papacy received a deadly wound when the state turned against it at the conclusion of the French Revolution. But this was not the end of the papacy's career, was it? Prophecy predicts that after a period of convalescence the deadly wound will be healed when the United States will return the sword of the civil power into the papacy's hand. Then the papacy will behave once more as it did in the past. Thus the history of the past papal oppression will be repeated in the future because the papacy will rise once again in, the, in power. Are you following me? Now in summary, Ellen White believed that Daniel 11, 30-36, and that includes verses 30-39, to was fulfilled in the past. Though she does not specifically quote verses 37 to 39, when you study them carefully, it's part of the career of the papacy. She also believed that much of the history described in these verses would be repeated in similar fashion in the future. Now, if verses 30 to 39 had already been fulfilled in the past, in Ellen White's day, then the future repetition of the history of these verses must be found where? in verses 40 to 45. Notice the following three quotations on the past and future role of the papacy. Very interesting. The influence of Rome in the countries that once acknowledged her dominion is far from being destroyed, and for prophecy foretells a restoration of her power. I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. So how many stages does the career of the papacy have? Two. Verses 30 to 39, the past. Verses 40 to 45, the future. Not a repetition of prophecy, but a repetition of history, because it's the same power that is ruling. Now, notice the second statement, by the way that one is Great Controversy 579, notice the next statement. When our nation, that is the United States, shall so abjure the principles of its government as to enact a Sunday law, 
Protestantism will in this act join hands with popery. It will be nothing else than doing what? Then giving life, which means that it must have been dead, right? To the tyranny which has long been eagerly watching its opportunity to spring again. What does that indicate, spring again? It means that it acted in the past, right? To spring again into active despotism. And then that's uh, Testimonies, Volume 5, page 712. And here comes the third quotation. When the land which the Lord provided as an asylum for His people, that they might worship Him according to the dictates of their own consciences, the land over which the, for long years the shield of omnipotence has been spread, the land which God has favored by making it the depository of the pure religion of Christ, when that land shall through its legislators abjure the principles of Protestantism and give countenance to Romish apostasy and tampering with God's law, it is then that the final work of the man of sin will be revealed. Protestants will throw their whole influence and strength on the side of the papacy by a national act enforcing the false Sabbath. Now notice the terminology here. They will give what? Life and vigor. So did this system have life and vigor then before this? Only during the 1260 years, but it lost it, right? So she continues saying, they will give life and vigor to uh, uh, the li life and vigor, reviving, notice the word once again, reviving, that means that she was dead before, right? Reviving her tyranny and oppression of conscience, then it will be the time for God to work in mighty power for the vindication of His truth. So are you clear on this point so far? Daniel 11, 30 to 39 is the past career of the papacy during the 1260 years. Scenes similar to the history that took place will be repeated in the future. Not the prophecy, but scenes similar of the history of that period. So where would you expect to find the similar scenes of history in the future? It would have to be verses 40 to 45, because if 30 to 39 is past, 40 to 45 would be the only place where you could look for the future scenes. Now the question is, does Ellen White have anything to say about the events that are described in verses 40 to 45? See she already described verses 30 to 36, she said that's past, that's how the papacy acted in the past. But the big question is, does Ellen White have anything to say about verses 40 to 45, the future repetition of history? where the papacy will behave as it behaved in the past. Well, let's notice this. Where would we even begin to look if she never quotes these verses or even alludes to their terminology? I believe the key which will unlock her understanding of these verses is found in her understanding of Daniel 12 verse 1. Though Ellen White never quoted or even alluded to the language of Daniel 11 40 to 45, in the book, The Great Controversy, she did quote the very next verse, Daniel 12 and verse 1. I believe that the place where she quotes Daniel 12 verse 1 contains the key which unlocks her understanding of the immediately preceding verses. Are you seeing the principle that we talked about yesterday? So if she, if she quotes Daniel 12 verse 1, maybe if you work backwards, you'll know what she has to say about verses 40 to 45 of the previous chapter. In other words, you don't work inductively, you work deductively. You work like a, like a detective. You know, a detective gathers clues after the crime. See, the criminal, he went through a series of steps, so by deduction, you have to work from forwards, from after the crime, backwards. Usually we work inductively. But when you study uh, Daniel 12 verse 1, you have to work deductively because Ellen White doesn't have anything to say apparently about verses 40 to 45, but she does quote 12 verse 1, so instead of working from verse 40 forwards, which we can't do because she never uses the language of verses 40 to 45, why not start at Daniel 12 verse 1 where she quotes that in, in Great Controversy and see what she has to say before that specific verse. 
Because Ellen White did not quote or even allude to the terminology of verses 40 to 45 in the Great Controversy, we cannot work from verse 40 forwards, because we don't know where her comments on verse 40 are found. What we must do then is work deductively from Daniel 12, 1 and 2 backwards. So let's take a look at Daniel 12 verses 1 and 2. At that time Michael shall stand up. I have underlined four phrases here. At that time Michael shall stand up. That's phrase number one. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, that's the second phrase, there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, that's the third phrase, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth, here's number four, shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So let me ask you, are those four events successive one right after the other? Of course they are. First you have Michael standing up, then you have the time of trouble, then God's people are delivered, and then you have the special resurrection, those who awake. They are a sequence of events. So the bold type indicates that there are four sequential events in Daniel 12, 1 and 2. The standing up of Michael, the time of trouble, the deliverance of God's people, and the special resurrection. Now let's notice how Ellen G. White developed these four events in the Great Controversy. But let's do it in reverse order beginning with the fourth item on the list, the special resurrection. Are you understanding what we're going to do? We're going to work backwards, and there's a reason for that. Now, where does Ellen White quote Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2, which is the fourth item? Great Controversy 637, she says, Graves are opened, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So does Ellen White quote Daniel 12 verse 2? Yes she does, in Great, in great Controversy 637. Now would you expect, if Ellen White is uh, given these events in chronological order, would you expect uh, the previous event, event number 3, to be a little bit before this one? Of course. So let's go to Great Controversy page 635 to see if working backwards she mentions event number 3. Ellen White describes the third item on the list, in fact, the chapter's title in Great Controversy 635 is God's People Delivered. At the beginning of the chapter she states, the people of God, some in prison cells, some hidden in solitary retreats in the forest and the mountains, still plead for divine protection, while in every quarter companies of armed men, urged on by a host of evil angels, are preparing for the work of death. It is now in the hour of utmost extremity that the God of Israel will interpose for the what? For the deliverance of His chosen. So does she mention deliverance, God's people will be delivered in page 635? Yes. Now where would you expect to find phrase number two? Uh, maybe a little bit earlier? But let me read a, another statement uh, here before we go to uh, the second phrase in the order. It will be noticed also that Ellen White concluded the previous chapter, the previous one to God's people delivered, with a clear allusion to Daniel 12 verse 1, where we are told that those who are written in the book will be delivered. So she ends the chapter on the time of trouble with the idea of God's people being delivered, and then the very next chapter the title is God's people delivered. Notice what she says, Glorious will be the what? the deliverance of those who have patiently waited for His coming, whose names are written in the book of life. So you see we're working backwards? Now, where would you expect to find phrase number two? Earlier in Great Controversy, right? Now let's notice Great Controversy page 616. Ellen White describes the second item on the list by explaining the time of trouble through which God's people will go. In fact, on page 616 she says, The people of God will then be plunged into those scenes of affliction and distress described by the prophet as what? As the time 
of trouble. And so on page 616 she's describing item number two. Are you seeing this? 637, 635, 616. Where would you expect to find the first item on the list? Earlier than 616, correct? Notice page 613. Ellen White begins the chapter on the time of trouble by quoting Daniel 12 verse 1, and then amplifies the meaning of the standing up of Michael, the first item on that list. This is her quotation. Then Jesus ceases his intercession in the sanctuary above. When he leaves the sanctuary, darkness covers the inhabitants of the earth. In that fearful time, the righteous must live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. So is she quote, is she commenting there on the standing up of Michael in the close of probation? Yes. Absolutely. So what have we been doing? Instead of working forwards, we're working backwards. Now, let's review here. 613, the standing up of Michael. 616, the time of trouble. 635, God's people delivered. And 637, the special resurrection. Now, let's take a look at a very important little expression, the importance of the expression at that time. It is extremely important to realize that Daniel 12, 1 and 2 cannot be understood independently of its context. Daniel 12, 1 and 2 is actually a continuation of the flow of events that transpired in the previous verses. In other words, verses 40 to 45. This is clearly indicated by the fact that Daniel 12 verse 1 begins with a time reference, at that time, which links Daniel 12 verse 1 with what occurred previously in verses 40 to 45. Are you with me or not? Now, the key question is, where would we expect to find Ellen White's comments about what takes place before Daniel 12 verse 1? The answer is unmistakable. It must be found in the pages that immediately precede the chapter on the standing up of Michael and the time of trouble. Is this making sense? See, we're doing the work of a detective. We're working backwards. You know, <laughs> the detective, when there's a crime, he has, to, he has to work backwards and retrace the steps of the individual who committed the crime. We're not saying that this is a crime. <laughs> but we're, we're, we're using just an example of working backwards. Now, we need to understand the literary structure of Daniel 11:44 b that is the second half of the verse, uh, through verse 45, and Daniel 12, verse 1. In other words, Daniel 11:44, the last part of the verse, and verse 45, we're going to compare now with Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Now let's carefully consider the literary structure of Daniel 11, 44b through 45, as it relates to Daniel 12, verse 1, in order to ascertain to what event the expression at that time refers to. A comparison of these two paid passages reveals that they are describing the same events in the same order, but with a different terminology and emphasis. In other words, 11, 45, 44b through 45, and Daniel 12 verse 1 are describing the same events, but with different terminology and a different emphasis. You'll, you'll see what I mean. Let's take Daniel 11, 44b through 45 first. The king of the north goes out to destroy and annihilate many. That's 44, 11, 44b. The next event is in verse 45a, where it says the king of the north sets up the tents of his palace in a strategic place between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. And then 1145b says, The king of the north comes to his end with none to help him. You, know, you see the sequence there? He goes out to destroy, he sets up the tents of his palace, and he comes to his end with none to help him. Now let's notice Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Michael stands up to defend his people. Why does he stand up to defend his people? Because in the A line above, the king of the north has gone out to destroy them. Why does a time of trouble such as never was ensue? 
because the king of the north has set up the tents of his palace in a strategic place between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. And what, does, what is meant by the king of the north coming to his end with none to help him? It means that God's people will be what? God's people will be delivered. Are you understanding this? Now let's continue the commentary. Daniel 11, 44b through 45 and 12, 1 are precisely parallel, but they portray a different emphasis. Whereas Daniel 11, 44b through 45 highlights the activities of the king of the north, and its destiny for oppressing God's people. Daniel 12 verse 1 focus on the jeopardy of God's people at the hand of the king of the north and their deliverance by God. This is the way that it works out. Now notice, when the king of the north goes out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many, Michael will stand up to protect and defend them. When the king of the north places the tents of his palace in a strategic location to deliver the final death blow against God's people, they will go through a terrible time of trouble such as never was. But the king of the north will come to his end with none to help him when God intervenes to deliver his people who are written in the book. The expression at that time thus links Daniel 11, 44b and 45 with Daniel 12 verse 1. Are you following me? Now, what about Daniel 11, 44a? You say, why did you begin at Daniel 11, 44b? Well, let's notice at the first part of verse 44. But what about Daniel 11, 44a? Here we are told that tidings from the north and from the east will trouble the king of the north. This phrase explains the reason why the king of the north will go out to attempt to destroy and annihilate many. The last half of verse 44 says he's going to go out to destroy and annihilate many. Why is it that he's going to do that? Because the first half of the, bus, uh, of the verse says that tidings from the north and from the east will what? Will trouble the king of the north. Notice what the verse says. But news from the east and the north shall trouble him, and that means to alarm him or to disturb him, that is the king of the north, therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. What is it that leads the king of the north to go out and try and destroy God's people? there's some certain tidings that come from the north and from the east that infuriate him. Now, what is this news from the east and the north that so infuriates the king of the north that he seeks to destroy many? We must go to the book of Revelation for the answer because we are told that bo the book of Daniel is unsealed by the book of Revelation. In fact, Ellen White says in Christ Triumphant, page 344, the books of Daniel and Revelation are one. One is a prophecy, the other a revelation. One book, uh, one a book sealed, and the other a book opened. Now, listen carefully. Revelation 7 verse 2 describes an angel who ascends from the east, having the seal of the living God. What is the seal of the living God? It's the Sabbath message, folks. This angel comes to seal the faithful of God upon their foreheads. In contrast, the land beast will impose what? The mark of the beast on pain of death to those who refuse it. So what are the tidings from the east? It's the sealing message. What about the tidings from the north? Revelation 18, 1 through 5, portrays a powerful angel who descends from where? From heaven. And where is heaven? in the sides of the north, that's right, and gives a clarion call for God's people to reject the mark of the beast and to get out of Babylon before Babylon is destroyed. Thus the tidings from the north and from the east are identified by the book of Revelation as the message of the sealing and the call to come out of Babylon. Good, good to see, hear those amens. You're following along, good. Ellen White concurs with this biblical view. The chapter immediately preceding the one on the standing up of Michael and the time of trouble is titled The Final Warning. Huh, how interesting, The Final Warning. Ellen White begins this chapter in Great Controversy 603, is that earlier? Yes, in page 603 by quoting Revelation 18 verse 1, verse 2, verses 4 and 5. 
in perfect accordance with Revelation 7 verse 2, she then described on page 605 the issue that will divide the world. This is what she says, while the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God. The keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator, while one class by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers received the mark of the beast, the other choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority reveal received the seal of God. So does the previous chapter deal with the sealing? The angel that comes from the east? Absolutely. In the same chapter Ellen White goes on to describe the anger that this message will cause in the religious world. Remember that the tidings from the north and the east infuriate the king of the north? Now notice what Ellen White says on page 607. She says, the power attending the message will only what? Will only madden those who oppose it. And on pages 614 and 615 she says, the power attending the last warning has enraged the wicked. Their anger is kindled against all who have received the message, and Satan will excite to still greater intensity the spirit of hatred and persecution. So what, is, what are the tidings from the north and from the east? It's the loud cry of Revelation 18, and it is the sealing of Revelation chapter 7 that infuriates the king of the north. And Ellen White comments this earlier than what we find in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. So does Ellen White have anything to say about the tidings from the north and from the east, and the anger of the king of the north going out to destroy God's people? Of course she does. She doesn't use the verses, she doesn't use the terms, but if you follow the sequence you're going to find that the sealing, the angel that comes from the east, is equivalent to tidings from the east, and the message of the loud cry that comes from heaven, from the north, is the, the tidings from the north. Now let's continue. Thus the news from the north is identified in Revelation 18 as the loud cry of the angel who descends from heaven, from the north. And the news from the east is the message concerning the seal of God in Revelation 7. This message from the north and from the east is described in Daniel 11.44a, where the king of the north is filled with fury to the point of wanting to destroy God's remnant as described in Daniel chapter 11 verse 44 b. So far so good? Amen. All right, very good. Now let's talk about the beginning point of Daniel 11 40 to 45. See we've only, we've only dealt with some of the events. I'm not going to go through all of the other events that take us all the way to verse 40, be, but, but you have the principle now, right? You know now that, that you can work backwards. So where would you expect to find Ellen White's comments about what comes before verse 44 of chapter 11? Well you have to go earlier, don't you? Now we have focused in this article or this lecture primarily on the events from Daniel 11.44 to Daniel 12 verse 2. But if we continued moving backwards in the Great Controversy before page 603, we would find in reverse order that Ellen White expounds upon each phrase of Daniel 11, 40 to 45, ending with the chapter on the Bible and the French Revolution, where the deadly wound of Daniel 11:40a is described. That's pages 265 to 288. Though she does not employ the terminology of verses 40 to 45, the sequence of events clearly re reveals that she is discussing these verses. In Daniel 11:40a, we are told that the king of the south would push at the king of the north at the time of the end. Ellen White clearly identifies the beginning of the time of the end as the year 1798, when France dealt the papacy its deadly wound. So where does uh, Daniel 11 verse 40 begin? It begins with the French Revolution. And it begins in Great Controversy, page 356. The word push does not adequately portray the idea of the text. The historical event that is described by this word was not a friendly nudge or a shove. The NIV translates, will engage him in battle, while the ESV translates, shall attack him. 
That is, in the year 1798, some power described as the king of the south would attack the king of the north. And Ellen was, so where do you begin in the great controversy, the study of verse 40? You begin where she comments on the French Revolution, page 356. And so as you continue studying after page 356, you're going to discover all of the events between verse 40 and verse 44. Now, let's continue here. There is a wide consensus among students of prophecy in the Seventh-day Adventist Church that the King of the North represents the papacy, and until recently there was a broad consensus that the King of the South represents secularism as it is manifested in the French Revolution. But times have changed, and some Adventist preachers, as they look at current events, are reinterpreting the King of the South as a symbol of militant Islam. Literally and geographically speaking, the King of the South was Egypt, because Egypt was the kingdom that was south of Israel. But in the end time we are not dealing with literal geographical locations, but rather with global systems. We've studied that. Who is the King of the South, spiritually speaking? I believe that Revelation 11, which is linked with the fifth and sixth trumpets by the way, clearly identifies France as spiritual Egypt. While Babylon represents a global apostate religious system, Egypt symbolizes the secular powers of the world that threw off the yoke of papal Rome beginning with France. Revelation 17 explains that for a very short while at the end of time the secular powers of the world will once again join together in unholy wedlock with the harlot, but in the end the, uh, the kings of the earth will hate the Babylonian harlot and destroy her. Babylon was literal and geographical, Babylon was the literal and geographical king of the north in biblical times, because it was the enemy that invaded literal Israel from the literal north. But today the king of the north is a global spiritual system of counterfeit religion, the Roman Catholic papacy. The papacy is certainly not literally north of literal Israel, actually it is west. We must therefore inter interpret the king of the north and the king of the south symbolically. And what was the main characteristic of France in 1798? Why is France called Egypt? The spirit of the French Revolution was atheism, but actually Daniel 1140a involves far more than atheism. The genius of the French Revolution, culminating with the captivity of Pope Pius VI, was to secularize the government and separate it from its adulterous relationship with the church. In the course of several decades after the French Revolution, country after country in Europe established secular governments separate from the, separate from the dominance of the papacy. Ellen White has stated why the papacy has not been able to ascend to power once more. She says, let the restraints now imposed by secular governments be removed and Rome be reinstated in her former power and there would speedily be a revival of her tyranny and persecution. So Daniel 11 verse 40 says that the king of the south would push at the king of the north. And the time of the end there is 1798 according to the spirit of prophecy. So we have to look for an event where the king of the south attacked the king of the north in 1798 or around that time. What event do we find that fulfills that prophecy? France. Because France said, I don't know God. France rejected the true God and attacked Babylon or the king of the north, which is the papacy. And Ellen White comments that, that on page 356. So we know what the starting point is. The starting point for Daniel 11 verse 40 is page 356. The ending point of Daniel 12 verse 2 is found in Great Controversy, page 637. So what do you have in between? All of the events between verse 40 and Daniel 12, verse 2. So all you have to do is study the pages in between there, and you're going to find Ellen White's concept of verses 40 to 45. Are you with me or not? Now, we have the following beginning and ending points then for Daniel 11, verses 40 to 45. Daniel 11, 40a, 
is commented on in great controversy 265 to 288, that's the French Revolution. France attacks the papacy, inflicts the deadly wound, the illicit love relationship between church and state is severed, and thus the papacy is restrained. The next passage is Daniel 1140b through 1143. In Great Controversy, Ellen White from page 289 to page 605 comments on these events. These verses describe events that transpire between the infliction of the deadly wound in 1798 and the loud cry. Then Daniel 1144a, you have in Great Controversy 605, it's the loud cry and the sealing message that trouble and enrage the king of the north, or the papacy. Then you have Daniel 11:44b and Daniel 12 verse 1, the first part of the verse, and Great Controversy 607, where you have the rage of the wicked increasing because of the loud cry and the wicked wanting to destroy God's people. And then you have Daniel 11 verse 45a and 12:1b, which are parallel, beginning with Great Controversy 613 and following. There you have the universal death decree against God's people. It is signed as the king of the north sets up his tents in a strategic position to deliver the final death blow against God's people. This causes a time of trouble for God's people such as never has been. Then you have Daniel 11:45b, which is parallel to Daniel 12 verse 1 c, or the third part of the verse, and that is commented on in Great Controversy 635 and following. There the king of the north comes to his end with none to help him because his supporters forsake him and as a result God's people are delivered. And then Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2 which is commented on in Great Controversy 637 Ellen White describes the special resurrection of those who died in the faith of the third angel's message. Thus the two reference points for the beginning and ending of Daniel 1140 to 45 are the French Revolution at the beginning, as described in Great Controversy 265 to 288, and the deliverance of God's people and the special resurrection in Great Controversy 635 and 637. In between these two reference points, we have the events that Ellen White describes in Great Controversy 289 to 604. A careful study of these pages will reveal that Ellen White comments on all the details in verses 40b through verse 43 without actually using the language. Are you following along with this? Amen. It's extremely interesting. So does Ellen White have anything to say about verses 40 to 45? Yeah. You bet she does. But, but she doesn't use the verse, she doesn't quote the verses, and she doesn't use the language. So people say, oh Ellen White was silent on that. No she wasn't. She simply uses a different terminology and there's a historical reason for that. Now let's go quickly here because time is almost up. It is simply amazing how Ellen White vividly describes the events of Daniel 11 40 to 45 without ever quoting the verses or alluding to the language. Why didn't she just come out and quote the verses and then comment on them? There's a clear historical reason. The original view of the pioneers was that the King of the North represents the Roman Catholic Papacy. This is the clear view expressed in the pamphlet, A Word to the Little Flock Scattered Abroad, co-authored by James and Ellen White in 1847. But in the early 1870s Uriah Smith, who was the highly respected editor of the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, changed the view of the pioneers by reinterpreting the King of the North as Turkey. You see, in Smith's day Turkey was prominent in the news, so he changed the traditional view to fit current events. James White was flabbergasted by Smith's new view and accused him of removing one of the landmarks of the Advent movement. Things started getting nasty and members began taking sides. In this context Ellen White instructed her husband to desist of his criticism. She knew that an understanding of Daniel 11 40 to 45 was not a matter of life and death at that time. Her main concern at that moment was to preserve the unity of the church. If Ellen White had quoted the verses of Daniel 11, 40-45 and offered a view contradictory, contradictory to Uriah Smith's, she would have been accused of nepotism, so she commented on these verses without quoting them or alluding to the language knowing full way, 
full well that someday someone would discover her view of the matter. Amen. Significantly, in the eschatological portion of the great controversy, Ellen White does not mention Islam even once as playing any role in the fulfillment of Bible prophecy in the end time. It appears that Ellen White saw no prophetic significance to the rise of radical Islam. The same is true of the great chain prophecies of Scripture. There is no reference to Islam in the prophecies of Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 9, Revelation 12, Revelation 13, Matthew 24, and Revelation 17. Neither is there any reference to Islam in the series of the churches and the seals. Ellen White's silence on the role of Islam in Bible prophecy has puzzled some Seventh-day Adventist scholars who have concluded that Ellen White simply did not have all the light on end time events. At least one of these scholars has even reached the conclusion that Ellen White was wrong in her interpretation of the little horn as a symbol of the papacy and he reinterpreted it as Islam. That's Sam Bakyoki. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that Islam might not play a, a role in the precipitation of end time events as they are described in the Great Controversy. It is true that Islam might serve as a catalyst for the fulfillment of Bible prophecies concerning the United States and the papacy, but I do not believe that the rising power of militant Islam is contemplated directly by prophecy itself. That is to say, in the light of the biblical evidence, I do not believe that radical Islam fulfills any specific end time prophecy, but very well could serve as a catalyst for the fulfillment of prophecy. After all, radical Islam has brought the United States to prominence and has led it to flex its military muscles. It has made the curtailing of our civil and religious liberties easier, and it has also misdirected the eyes of Christians and even a few Seventh-day Adventists to the Middle East for the fulfillment of prophecy, thus hiding from view the powers that will play a role in the end time events, the papacy and apostate Protestantism. Time has proven that Uriah Smith's reinterpretation of the King of the North was wrong. Will we learn from his mistake? Will we ever learn that the best way to understand prophecy is not to read the newspapers or to watch CNN, but rather to study our Bibles? <laughs> so were you able to follow along? Yes. It's a fascinating study, isn't it? Amen. I mean, it's like detective work. It's fun. I had a great time working my way through this. And you know, time and again Ellen White makes comments that you can discover if you just use these principles. Alright, we got through it. Wow, I was really motoring there. 